Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. We just have wonderful family way in there and way over there. And we, we get a lot of joy at seeing the people we talk to so much. And then finally, there they are. I got a, 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 a gift over in a, from a second grade class who heard about the, the healing our dear Lord gave me. And come on, kids, over here. Well, you can have that. Hold this and stretch it out. There you go. Now let's see. I probably have it upside down. But I don't think I do. Okay, just open it up. Whoa. Yeah, they had some tape on here. Okay. Isn't that great, huh? We'll just show you. I, I wanted to write to you, but since you went to all this work, and here's their pictures here, and they're always saying that, that they were so happy that the Lord healed me. And I think it's wonderful for second graders to even think of doing something like this, huh? So I, I wanted to thank you all and thank them. Okay. There you go. Didn't know you were going to be on TV tonight, did you? <laughs> <laughs> You know, we are always waiting and waiting uh, for some assurance. What is this? I did it. Okay. For some assurance that we're kind of making it. Do you ever wonder, huh? Did you ever say to St. Teresa, give me a rose? Oh, how many? Oh, look at those heads bouncing. Yeah, everything. Now, can you give me a rose and tell me this, tell me that? Well, I, I suppose it's normal to, to want to know, um, do you love me? Now, we can really do that with people, see, because we don't always know if people love you. you know, if you knew, you wouldn't have to ask. It's like the man or, or, or the woman was crying and at breakfast table, he said, what's the matter? And she said, you never tell me you love me. He said, I did the day we were married. <laughs> 30 years ago. <laughs> so as human beings, we're always in that position of wonder. Not the awe. We're not, we're not awestruck at other people's love for us. But we do wonder. Unfortunately, we, we wonder about God's love for us, but I don't know how you can wonder. Because he died for us. You say, yeah, he died for everybody. <laughs> no, 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 he died for you. And there are many things that not at many times uh, for example, when I, the Lord healed me of my bad stomach, 
condition, I, I knew for the first time he loved me. See? And we all get in that position sometime. You just say, well, does he love me? And great sinners, which I hope we get a lot in this, this year, you know, I want to get out of you terrible sinners who are scared to death. Where are you going to run? <laughs> Where are you going? If you go to the depths of sea, he's there. If you go to the heights of heaven, he's there. Where are you going? Do you think you're, you're, you're hidden from him? Now, we know God loves us when he died for us. There it is. You say, well, he died for everybody. No, he died for you. For you. As if no one else existed. Some of you people are women, especially, are so jealous of your husbands. Um, why? I don't think anybody wants your husband. I think it's all up here. <laughs> this woman came up to me one day and she says, I sure am glad you're in a cloister. I said, so am I. She said, well, I would have been afraid if you weren't. She said, I think my husband loves you. And I looked at her straight in the eye. I said, sweetheart, you have no worry from me. <laughs> I, you see, we're always imagining that nobody loves us, and then we get very angry if anybody loves us. Are we strange people? Huh? It looks like we're not able to handle love. And so God knew that, and he died for you. I don't know anybody who would die for you. I, mean, I don't know anybody that has that kind of love, except the martyrs. Certainly they died for Jesus. St. Peter died upside down. The apostles all, except John, they've tried to boil him in oil, but it didn't take. He just walked right out, and there he was. So they put him out in Patmos, you know, tried to get rid of him, put him on an island somewhere. But he wrote the wonderful Gospel of John in the Book of Revelation, and oh, he was like an eagle. But God does prove to us many, many, many times how much he loves us. We don't see it. We don't see it. There's just a thousand things that God does for us all the time. But we'll say, oh, I got so lucky. Lucky? Well, nobody gets lucky. Oh, I'm so fortunate. Why? Because of God, you see. The Lord God loves you. And he does a lot of little things. In this book, he made breakfast for his apostles. And they were not faithful men at that point. They all left him except John. And the only reason John was in there is because he hung on to Our Lady. Let me tell you something. If you're having problems, any kind of problem, go to Mary. Go to Mary. Go to Joseph. We have a, a big statue in one of our monasteries that says, Ite ad Joseph. Go to Joseph. Go to Mary. We go to the wrong people. Because she loves us. She loves us. And she has appeared to, oh, place after place for this century, telling us in every instant to repent, go to confession, 
and do God's will. It's not hard, it's not hard. Today it's hard because we're always in a position, we're always looking at something that's sinful. Put on the TV. If you go to Europe, you see the worst billboard, but they don't call them billboards. They wrap things around telephone poles and so that everybody who stops for a red light has to look at these terrible signs. Why? Why do you do that? Everywhere you go today, whether you listen to the radio, to television, to newspapers, anywhere, you get something immoral or you see a woman made to the image and likeness of God to be like cement in the building, a bond of union in the building, and she degraded, degraded by advertising, by pictures, by anything. Women have never, never been so degraded in the history of the world, and they call it feminism. I think it's nuts. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're like an animal, just kind of exposed there. I'd rather read the geographic. At least she had been, animals are where they should be in a tree. <laughs> Not on a poster. As animals, we're pretty dumb anyway. When you're born, it takes how many years to get you to the point where you have sense? When you're born, somebody has to take care of you for at least, what is it, a couple of years, huh? Change your diapers. No animal does that. They're born and they go for food. You just lay there. <laughs> your eyes they aren't even open. What makes us so wonderful is the image of God in us. Our memory, our imagination, our, our will, our intellect. But you see, when we degrade the intellect and we ruin it by drugs, alcohol, lust, then the body becomes like an animal. You never get enough of whatever pleases you. And the purpose of penance is to change. See, there's nobody listening to me tonight who cannot change, have a real conversion. A real conversion. You could be a saint overnight. Overnight, because we have a wonderful sacrament called confession. <gasps> I want you to think, one of my best meditations is when we're driving down the road and I see uh, a trailer of crushed cars. Did you ever see one? Did you ever see them? I mean, you may have 50 crushed cars on one trailer, and they're all plump, rusted. Do you mean how many people and how hard they work for those crushed cars? Where are they now? Gone, just crushed, ready to be melted down again for somebody else to buy. Do you realize how attached you could get to a car. Some people buy cars, they don't care about them. You can tell the way they clean them. And some people are out there polishing like they were diamonds. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I saw somebody, you know when you're traveling, you get all those gnats on the window? You know those gnats? They just kind of, you're hitting them all the time. I thought somebody would get out of the car and go, <laughs> I think that's nuts. You're going to get more if 
five miles down the road. <laughs> now we take all of that care for what? Gnats on a windshield. I bet you haven't been confession in 30 years. You got more than gnats on your soul, I can guarantee that. <laughs> You got some boulders sticking onto you. <laughs> you don't even care. You, you don't even see the boulders. And I, I have prayed, oh, for a long time, Lord, show us what we look like in your eyes. Oh, you would change your little mind. You say, oh, I die. Well, let's go to confession. You won't have to worry about it. Why does Our Lady keep telling us, repent, go to confession, have deep respect for the Eucharist? Why? Because we are murdering our souls, really. Abortion is murder. You can't say, oh, you don't want to say that. But you have to say it because it's true. Can you be forgiven? Of course. You can be forgiven of every sin, no matter what it is. No matter what. God is always ready to reach out his hand and pull you up. What's so sad is that no matter what Our Lady has said, many don't believe it, Many forget, and many don't care. So you and I have been given three talents. Three talents. We have an imagination that can create, invent, a memory that recalls, oh, awesome things, good things, bad things. Then I have an intellect, see? An intellect says, this is a book, and I can do a thousand things with it. And, and I know what to do, and I know how to do it. An animal doesn't. And then I have a will. A will that accomplishes, accomplishes. You admire people, for example, who are crippled, and they do wonderful things. They do more things than when they could walk or do anything. And because they have a will. One of the things that happens to all of us when we lose hope, you know what hope is? Hope is not a supernatural virtue. Hope is supernatural. It means I believe everything that Jesus told me in this book. And I rely upon him. It's not like human hope. You look at your, your son, you say, well, I hope he turns out okay. <laughs> the poor guy don't have a chance. I hope my daughter's marriage will last. What makes you think it won't? That's natural hope. Natural hope, many times, there's no hope. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. A hope, a hope. No, it means I don't think it's going to happen. I hope I win the lottery and I'm going to give Mother Angelica 90% of it. <laughs> In the first place, the government takes half of it. In the second place, you're going to forget Mother Angelica totally. <laughs> That's a false hope. Actually, I don't know why you buy a ticket, because you're helping to provide the money for somebody else. I never understood gambling because No, my uncle had slot machines. I come from a part of the world you probably don't know anything about. Mafia country. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Now, he was not in the Montfidia, but he had a saloon like my grandfather did. And he sold beer and other assorted items. And he had slot machines, lots of them. Well, my mother and I were proud and we never wanted the family to know how bad off we were. But if I got good and hungry, I managed to meander up to the saloon. <laughs> I'd go early in the morning when he was uh, cleaning the floors and emptying the spittoons. None of you would know what a spittoon is. <laughs> It's one of those shiny brass things you spit into. <laughs> and so I went up there and Uncle Honey looked at me and they always knew that if I came around, I was probably hungry. How you do it? Okay. Huh. You want to play a slot machine? Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a future nun. Can you beat it? <laughs> So he gives me a few nickels. He said, now wait a minute. He said, this thing's kind of broke. I got to fix it. I don't know what he did in the back, but it worked for me. I never won before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so he's finagling him. I thought, boy, it takes a long time to fix this thing. He said, okay, put a nickel in. He went, there were nickels everywhere, everywhere. Just fill the floor. I went after him like I was a starving individual, you know. I got home and my pockets were full of nickels. My mother looks at me horror stricken. She looks at me, where did you get those nickels? I said, hey, I got them in a slot machine. I said, a slot machine? Where are you bit? I said, honey, oh, hmm, where'd you get the nickel? I thought, honey, gave it to me. So she finally find out where I got all those nickels. Now, we do that a lot in life. You know, we, we gamble for something, but somebody somewhere has to help us. Many of us have been in precarious situations. And we've cried out for help, but it just seems impossible. And all of a sudden, it's, it's settled. It's, it's, I'm safe again. And we didn't do anything. We had a father in heaven, though, that said, oh, wait a minute now, let me fix this up for you. But we never thank him. He's not in our heart enough. To, to say, Lord, I love you and I thank you and I'm not going to put myself in this position again. Believe me, when my mother got through with me, I wanted to give all those nickels back. <laughs> but even God, the worst of sinners sometimes, he helps in a wonderful way. So you begin to see the hand of God in your life. I think one of the worst things in this whole wide world is ingratitude. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that hurt the most. Were there not ten made clean, where? Where are the nine? I think you wouldn't think God would care. I mean, he has everything. He's infinite. He's holy. He's powerful. Why would he care if only one person thanked and nine didn't? Because it's a virtue. There's nothing worse. And some of your people who are having family problems, ask yourself, when have I thanked my wife for breakfast? That she's supposed to make me breakfast. Hmm. When there's a wife, did you ever thank your husband for the work he did that day? But he's supposed to work. Yeah, we all know that. When have you ever thanked your children? They say, well, honey, thank you. You had good grades. 
or thank you, honey, because you didn't make good grades, but that's okay. You tried hard. Thank you for trying. Next year, next month, you'll do better. That's gratitude. And that's a part, a very important part of holiness. A very important part. Ask yourself, how many times do I ever say, thank you, Jesus? How many times do I ever say, thank you, Lord, for my pain? So, come on now, yeah. You know, when I was healed, my, my greatest fear, you're going to think I'm not so, but it's true. My greatest fear was, what will I do without that constant pain that kept me safe, kept me close to Jesus? force me to do things I couldn't have done before. I was really scared. I've been consoled that Jesus only changed the cross. He didn't take it away. Which means that we have to be grateful for our crosses. Have you ever thanked God for old age? Have you ever said, Jesus, I am so grateful my hair has turned totally white? <laughs> no, you go and spend $50 to make it look brown again. <laughs> but every day you look in the mirror, you see it sneaking up on you. <laughs> By the roots, see? I saw a woman with beautiful blonde, and I thought, boy, she's really kept up those years. When I got closer, it was deep black. <laughs> <sighs> Why can't you leave it white? Do we thank God for wrinkles? Oh, you're nuts, Mother Angelica. Why would I thank God for wrinkles? Well, God let them be there. They have to have some good. If not, to humiliate you. <laughs> to make you understand, look, your life is slipping away. I got to get my soul in order and close to Jesus. It's always funny to me that women, especially men, they're close to it. They got bald heads where they do, cover them. You know, my mother had a, a t she was a, 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 a telephone operator at the Canton Waterworks. And uh, so this man came with a windy day, really a windy day. And she was, you know, had these little things you put switches, you know, switchboard, you had to pull them in, pull them out. And, and um, and she was very busy, and she knew somebody was standing there. And she looked up, and this man's toupee was down here. <laughs> and she went. <laughs> she had to get up because she got hysterical. <laughs> and. I, I felt sorry for the man because I don't think he knew that it just went boom. <laughs> and and you, you wonder, you know, I call it the great cover-up. <laughs> the great cover-up. And I, I think some people, you know, we <laughs> this woman, just, she's kind of laughing when she told me that she had gone to confession. She accused herself of vanity. Vanity over makeup and everything else women wear. And, and apparently father knew who she was. And, 
And she said, Father, I'm guilty of vanity, and I spend a lot of money on my face and, and makeup. And, and he said to her, it's not vanity for you, Molly. <laughs> I'm all for making yourself look beautiful. I think it's a necessity. <laughs> That's not a problem. The problem is attachment, fear. That, that I think, is the real problem. If you can make yourself look beautiful and others can look at you with great joy, fine. But there is a certain amount of attachment that makes you forget God, forget where you're going, forget why you're here. So our whole life becomes a thrust towards looking better. It's not for the sake of making other people joy. It's for the sake of vanity. And we do that to a point as we get older, instead of, of really thinking, I'm on my way to the kingdom. That's the source of our joy. I think old age is the best wine. You know, in the, in the, the wedding of Cana, when our dear Lord told the servants to fill up the water jars, about 30 gallons in a jar. And, and when they poured it out, it was wonderful, awesome, beautiful wine. That's how I think old age is. I look forward to it because I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer to the day that God has designed that I shall see him face to face. I think the day that the old people, elderly, senior citizens, I like the way they try to make you feel good, you know. <laughs> senior doesn't make it any difference. If you're 75, you're 75. But you have an opportunity of making the youth encouraged. If they see you happy, they have something to look forward to. See, and society does not, does not encourage you to be happy as you get older. You're in the way, it's too expensive. What do we do with you? You can't work anymore. See, that's the enemy. That's the world. Our Catholicity teaches us that I have more value old than I did before. Why? I can be an example to you that no one else can be. I can, I can give them that the wisdom I've learned through the years. I can advise them. I can make them know that it gets better as you get older. I can give them examples of how to bear disappointment, heartache, loneliness. Because when they look at you then, they say, hey, you know, I'm miserable now, but it'll get better. The Orientals have a, or used to, especially Chinese, Japanese, a great respect, a great respect for old, for old age. Great respect. And so everything now in your life should be better. Why? Because you have experienced the love of God. You have experienced the goodness of God, the mercy of God. You can give real advice because you lived through it. 
and you can show that your faith rises above fear, discouragement, anger. It rises above because you have a God that died for you, died for you. You have every reason to be happy as you get older. You can pray more, you can read more, you can laugh more. Because there is a detachment in old age that you cannot get until you get to be older. So, for the rest of this Lent, at least this week, look at your pain, your sorrows, your loneliness, and face them with a smile. And accept where you are and who you are. It doesn't matter whether you've made a, a dent in society, whether you've been successful or you're just making it. It doesn't matter. Those things are nothing. What matters is that you know your God. And I saw some people in the last 10 days that never had a thing. Who lived in cold from the time they were born to the time they died. Who had no, none of the necessities we have. No water, no bathroom facilities, no gas, no electricity. They had a faith I've never seen before. It was awesome. Awesome. Well, you had to wonder, and I had to wonder when I left. I didn't have to evangelize them. They evangelized me. They had nothing, that they really had everything, everything. The whole village prayed at night at 7 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, one of the women goes through the village with a bell to remind the people in that village to repay, pray for the poor souls in purgatory. How do you like that? Hmm? So. Time for a call. Hello? Hello. Hi, where are you from? Uh, St. Louis. Good, and what is your question? Um, my question is, I was thinking what, what procedures you have to go through mm -hmm. to become Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, confession if you have to. Well, are you Catholic now? Not presently. Were you Catholic? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. Um, are you divorced or something? No, I, I'm single. You're single? How wonderful. <laughs> Married life is also wonderful. <laughs> Sweetheart, if you want to come back, all you need to do is go to confession. And you'll have a peace uh, you never knew before. It's not hard to come back. It's not hard to come back. Um, you see, you really, when you go to confession, you're not kneeling before a man. You're kneeling before Jesus. I'm sure he has many faults of his own. That's not the point. The priest never says, Jesus absolves you. No, he says, I absolve you. On his own, he would have no power. But he has ordained, he is ordained to forgive sins. What a awesome power. There, there's no power in the world. You say, oh, yeah, they are. You could be wealthy. You can own this. You can, no, that's not power. No. The power is in the priesthood. This is my body, he says. 
I absolve you of all your sins. That's power. And the humblest jury of ours was really dumb. And they only ordained it because there were no priests around after the revolution. And when he was presented to the bishop, he said, is he pious? He said, yeah. He said, well, ordain him. <laughs> I mean, they were really hard up. <laughs> but he converted over 270,000 people. He heard confessions 15 hours a day. A holy man. So that power, honey, is that power is there for you to receive. And come back to Jesus. It's not hard. And don't be ashamed. <laughs> Our dear Lord knows what you've done all your life. I would go to church and, and before you go to confession, say, Jesus, I love you. I'm sorry for all my sins. Then go to confession. And, and tell Father, I find this very hard and I'm embarrassed and I don't know what to do. I'll do my best. Say, yeah, I'll help you. And then he would say the most beautiful words ever uttered in the whole world. I absolve you. Oh, wow. And that's all you need to do. Don't worry about it. Then, as I said before, go and have yourself a chocolate sundae. <laughs> Because the Lord said to us, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner. Mm. You can make a lot of people up there very happy. <laughs> You're a sheep. And the shepherd waits for you with great love. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. My name's Hi. Joanne, and I'm calling from Pittsburgh, PA. Yeah, and what's your question? Um... Just recently, I've been coming back to the church. I've been getting a Mass and receiving the Holy Eucharist every day. Wonderful. And I feel wonderful when I do that. But I take care of my father. He's 84 years old, and he's better, and he got um, both legs are amputated. There are some days that I can't make it to Mass, and I feel guilty. And I was just wondering what I could do to overcome that guilt. You feel guilty? Or I he, do. Does he feel guilty or you? I do. I feel guilty because I can't make it to Mass sometimes because I'm taking care of them. Ah, oh, but you're doing God's will, sweetheart. You get to Mass for sure, I'm sure, every Sunday. And and don't put a, a wall between uh, y your Father and Jesus. What's happening, you're taking care of Jesus and your Father. When you go to Mass, Jesus takes care of you. See? There's not a competition. And I know you'll do everything you can to get to Mass on Sunday. But if your father is that bedridden and suffering, you take care of Jesus. You're not missing Jesus. You're taking care of Jesus. Mother Teresa was an awesome example of seeing Jesus in the most corrupt bodies. Most corrupt. So let, let me repeat that again so that you remember and you don't ever need to feel guilty. When your bad dad is so far in pain and misery and you have to stay home to take care of him, you're taking care of Jesus. When you go to Mass, Jesus is taking care of you. You receive Jesus. When you take care of your father, you become, he becomes Jesus for you, see? So it, it's, it's hard because our will is not there perhaps, but our longing, that's another good thing about that. Your thirst for God increases, doesn't it? Your hunger for God increases.
Well, then use that while you're taking care of your dad. Whatever you do for the least, well, your father's on that level now, the least. Did I hear her say her leg, his legs are amputated? Well, he is the least, poor man. So you're taking care of Jesus, huh? So don't you feel guilty at all? We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you so this from? This is Antoinette from New Jersey. Uh -huh. um, my question is, um, 17 months ago, I had a uh, major surgery for ovarian cancer, and I just completed 16 months of chemo, and I would like a prayer, too. But uh, Father, I had called Father over for my confession, and after he absolved me from my sins, he says, I will anoint you now with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and he took the oil, put it on both sides of my neck, and he says, now that will cover everything. And i like to know what that means, and also, why can't the souls in purgatory pray for themselves, as I pray for them, but why can't they pray for themselves? Right. Well, anointing is very special. Uh, we read it in the Gospel, anointing the sick, and it's a healing sacrament. It's a healing. Many people uh, have been healed with the anointing. In fact, in the Acts of the, the Apostles, it says if someone is sick, we pour oil on them, the oil of healing. And Holy Mother Church, because she is such a mother, has allowed uh, people to be anointed more frequently. My grandfather would never let us call a priest because he thought if the priest came, he was about to die. But in those days, they didn't call him till we were about to die. And he didn't want a priest. But that's not true because anointing is not only last sacrament if you're dying, but it's a, it's a healing of the soul and a healing of the body. And, and that's something we should, either, we should want to have. And, and priests have to remember that's a wonderful sacrament to give to those that are really sick in, in mind or in body because it, it's a, a necessary sacrament that we don't receive very often. You know? And so remember, you have healing sacraments. The anointing is a healing sacrament. Confession is a healing sacrament. Communion is a healing sacrament. It not only heals, but it builds the image of Jesus in you. That's a necessity. It not only forgives your sins, and not only makes you clean and holy before God, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit dwelling in you again, but it makes you more like the image of Jesus. So much so that our dear Lord said in chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel, if you do not receive my, uh, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you shall not have life in you. Hmm. What is life? Supernatural life. You know, it's an awesome thing for priests. And although priests can kind of get weary and you forget the awesomeness of your vocation. Boy, that, to be able to say, I absolve you of all your sins has to be. Hmm. You know, uh, in the life of Francis de Sales, St. Francis de Sales, he was uh, uh, the bishop and he had uh, many young men that were seminarians. And this one particular seminarian, uh, every time Francis de Sales would see him, he would see his angel, his guardian angel behind him, walking with him wherever he went. Well, after this young man was ordained a priest of God, no, he was in front of him. Yeah, I'm getting mixed up. In the beginning, when he was a seminarian, St. Francis saw him ahead of this young seminarian always guarding him. But when this seminary became a priest, the angel went behind him. 
because the vocation of priesthood is so awesome. Awesome. If you don't pray a lot, you're not, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose it. See? And so the priesthood is so awesome. And you and I, as the people of God, must take advantage of these wonderful sacraments. Mm. And some of you haven't been to confession in, ooh, years and years. <laughs> Please go. All of heaven prays for you to come home. And many of you Catholics have left the church, maybe joined some whoopie doo church. <laughs> you can have a lot of feelings, but you'll never get the blessed sacrament. Never. You never get the body, blood, soul, and divinity. That is an awesome gift. And only when we die and see him face to face will we realize <coughs> what we've missed, what we've misunderstood, mm. what we misused perhaps. Only then. But then it's too late. Too late. <sighs> Communion to me is one of the most, well, I don't know what I would do without him. We, in this day and age, you've got to have confession and communion. I don't know how you live without him, without seeing him in that wonderful host where you can walk in and say, Hi, Jesus. I'm here, and I love you, and I'm sorry I didn't come up to your expectations today. I'm sorry I allowed all these things to upset me. I'm sorry I allowed the world and events and my own faults and weaknesses, my own sins, to block your vision from my mind. I'm sorry. And, and then look at him, not yourself. Not the world. You know, the world is so bad, did you? Did you ever think the sex life of everybody in, in, in uh, government would be in newspapers day after day after day after day? Mm. You know, it's a really insult to our intelligence that these uh, columnists and newspapers uh, think that's the only thing you want to read about. <laughs> I, I just find today's world really sad. Don't you get tired of reading that stuff? Don't you get tired? And then you must feel guilty putting a man in. And it looks like we're never happy. You can't depend on politicians and governments and I don't care where they are. Even presidents and kings and queens should go to confession. <laughs> They'd all be better. We need, we need to say, I, am, I have sinned against you, God, and against the world, against mankind. And it's so easy to say that. You don't say, well, I'm ashamed. What, the whole world knows it? What are you ashamed of? <laughs> Do you think if you commit adultery, nobody knows? <laughs> I guarantee they know. Your next, day, your next door neighbor knows. Your front neighbor knows. The city knows. You're the only one that won't admit it. And be careful you don't use scripture to excuse it. 
this happened to a woman and she, you know, she told her husband, I know what you're doing. And she went and really went after him. And he said, well, God forgave. He said to this adulteress in the scriptures, go and sin no more. And no one condemn thee, neither will I. That's what he said to her. And she said, yeah. And then he, she, he said, go and sin no more. Can you imagine using scripture as an excuse? Well, you're a real sick old buddy. <laughs> Remember, God loves you. Also, don't forget that this network is brought to you by you. And who else would give it to you every Tuesday night? God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow.